You know, when I started this channel, I was pretty well convinced that it was going to be almost exclusively positive, upbeat content and reviews. I mean, how could you not have fun doing this hobby? So when this kit came along, the fact that it was offered as a kit, well, that was great, man. I mean, I'd kind of dared companies to do it. I said, less RTRs, more kits. I want to build them. Then this thing popped up. I had to get it. So get it, I did. And it did take a little while for it to actually show up. The reason it's actually taking me so long to actually make the video is that the build process was so unpleasant, so difficult, that I figured, okay, maybe I'll take it to the track. Maybe it'll show its colors at the track and it'll actually be a great car. And all of those frustrations building it will be wiped away by how it does on the track. Off to Indy RC we go to give it a try. Now, I usually don't go to Indy RC on off-road days, but uh, Tuesdays is an off-road practice day, so I figure I can get in there a little early and not bother anybody with these things. So let's get to it at the track here. I've also brought the LC Racing EMB that I built and did a video previously, but we'll compare it to that. That was educational. Welcome to Quiet RC. As usual, I'm Rob. Let's go ahead and talk about the Reflex 14B kit from Team Associated. Oh, I bet you want to see some of that driving footage. Well, stick around to the end and we'll talk about that for sure. Shh. We are absolutely going to jump right into the building of this. I built this a little while ago, so it's not so fresh in my memory, but what is fresh in my memory is the frustration of actually building this kit. So I'll try to keep my cool during this video, but no promise. To start off, you are, like with a lot of kits, going to do the front and rear differentials, which are built the same. Now, right away, I'm like, what, what are these differings? Because there is this weird annotation in the manual trying to tell you something about different differing sizes and teeth and everything like that and different numbers that have no correlation to anything. That is going to be a running theme throughout this video, throughout this build, is that the numbers don't mean anything that are in the manual. So it says something to the effect of uh, 21526 comes with two rings and two pinions. 21527 comes with two rings and pinions and spurs. No markings on any of these things as to what the what they're actually referring to. So whether it's two one five two six or five one uh, seven one or two seven, I don't know. So I don't know what it's referring to. I thought it might be referring to kit numbers, but I looked at the kit numbers and they don't correspond with those numbers either. It's gonna be a lot of this uh, requesting of you in this video here too. Is comment below if you know what the heck they're talking about. I think I've mentioned this in another associated kit that I've built. I can't remember exactly what it was, but the numbers that they put in the manual have little reference to what you're actually having in front of you. I know for a fact that if you want to like order these parts, that's how you order them. But if you have a part tree with 15 parts on it and in every step in the instructions, it's just referring to every different part by the same part number for the whole tree, it's not it's not helpful. Like, don't even put the number in the manual. It's not helpful. As you're building, you're putting the planetary gears in. They're extremely snug on the spindles of this, you know, three-sided axle thing that you're you're putting in there. I forget what it's called. Very snug. Um, I think that contributes to the overall issues with some of the drivetrain, and we'll get into that a little bit later. But it's very snug. They're plastic. The LC Racing, and I'll be comparing a lot of stuff to the LC Racing here, EMB1 uh, that I have here. They are metal, I believe. Now, I've done a video on this car a little while ago, and the link to that will be either here or down below. You can find it some way. I recommend checking it out. Also, when you're building it, no mention of diff grease whatsoever. I just assumed that they would want that. They do offer some stealth lube, I believe, in the kit or black grease of some sort. So I did put a little bit of that in, but there's no mention of, of that in the instruction. Again, I'm sure if I went out and found it, somebody would be able to tell you what exactly is going in there. Um, now I can't even remember. I might have put in actual like diff lube. The center diff looks very similar to the front and rear 
but it is put together differently. And there is this center shaft in there that has a hole on each end for your pins to go through uh, to hold everything in place. However, it's just barely shorter on one end versus the other. And again, the manual is not very clear on which is which, which way you flip it. I believe I did build it one way and figured out that I had to actually flip it all around even though I really tried very hard to look at the instruction manual to see which way it was supposed to go. Now you have the front and rear diffs in, you have the center shaft in with the center diff. The diff covers are very similar front and rear, but you will notice that there is a difference between the two, so make sure you are paying attention to that when you put them in. Back has this little uh, channel and the uh, Front one has a little extra hole on top. The drive shaft cap kind of pressure fits in there, so you can just push that on when you're done putting everything else in. When you're assembling the front steering, the image in the instruction manual is clearly that of a ball bearing, but what you're actually getting is a bearing or what we would just call a like brass bushing. I don't recall if I had some of those extra laying around. Uh, if I did, I did put in some bearings up front with the steering rack. I don't know why they have, it's, it's a full ball bearing kit, except for that. When you are putting this together, when you're following the manual, there is no indication as to what bag you're getting into. I don't even know why they label the bags at all. In this particular step, you are moving from one bag to another mid step. So you just have to kind of know that it really doesn't matter. Looking back, I would actually just open every bag, sort every screw, try and find all the right sizes, put them all together, and that's how I would do that if I were to do it all over again. This was another recurring thing in the manual is I couldn't really tell what screw they were actually calling for in the step. Uh, this also ex applied to washers versus spacers. So in this step right here, they have it labeled as BHST, which my assumption is that it stood for button head self tapping screw. So visually it looks like it has kind of coarser threads to actually tap into the plastic. The manual's not very clear on that. And this is gonna come back later to bite me. We'll get to that. Mounting the upper plate, a lot of issues with this step too. Doesn't tell you where the body mount actually goes. It doesn't tell you what screw to use for that. It just kind of has a picture of it and doesn't even give like a, a line to show exactly where it goes. So I just kind of had to guess there and know that they kind of generally use the same size screw without the, throughout the kit. I think it was a six millimeter one and I ended up using that. When I did get that first bit together, the drivetrain was so tight that I knew that something was wrong. Now I would take each individual part out, the front diff and the rear diff, uh, without the drive shaft in there, spun just fine. I put the drive shaft in, it spun just fine. I went to the online forums, kind of asked some questions about it, and the ultimate answer that I got was that you just have to really push the heck out of those bevel gears to really smash them on there. In fact, I'm not 100% sold that I have one of them pushed on all the way because the drivetrain is still fairly tight. To do this, I had to kind of disassemble the whole drivetrain again and really smash those, those bevel gears on. And even at this point, I found that when I was putting the steering bell crank back together, I couldn't tighten down the screws all the way because it would actually bind it. So on one side, I could tighten it just fine. On the other side, I had to back it up just a little bit to make sure that that whole steering linkage was moving freely. Going on to the outer part of the suspension, the arm mount bushings are directional. However, again, they don't label it very well in the instructions. So you're really trying to see what they're trying to do just visually looking at it. Now at this point, the manual is telling you to flip it over and you're going to put on this uh, plate that covers the bottom. Now, when you put in the steering, it tells you basically to put these screws on, but you can see that there's only one place they can possibly go and it's clearly gonna have something over it. It clearly requires countersunk screws. So I had to take all that apart, put that plate underneath, and then use actual flathead countersunk screws to put it back together. So step 10 tells you to put it, and then step 16, you really have to undo all of it and redo it again. Ugh. <laughs> Just another hilarious part with this manual that makes no sense. The C-hubs or the knuckles or whatever, have L and R on them up front. Very nice, left and right, got it, makes perfect sense. When you go to do the rear, 
they have A and B. But it doesn't tell you what A and B refer to if it's left or right. Again, you are just trying to visually match it up with the manual, which is not always the best way to do it, obviously. It was at this point that it was calling for some sort of washer, and I think it says the word washer, and to me, a washer is a metal piece, you know, a metal circle with a hole in it. However, what they really need in this step is they really want a spacer. They don't actually label what the spacer is, and that's coming off of a parts tree. The parts trees have tree numbers on them, and they have, uh, I can't remember if it's one, two, or three, or ABC, whatever, but they do label them on the parts tree, but in the manual, they're not telling you which number to choose. So I had to actually go back and take apart the rear suspension and put the correct spacers, not washers, on there. The shocks go together just like typical shocks do. It didn't have any issues with it, except it was actually missing the O-ring that goes inside the preload adjuster here. Again, I just thought it was me, maybe I lost them or something like that, but I did come across another person on the Facebook groups that said they had a kit that was also missing these. Now I guess at that point they had contacted Associated and Associated didn't even reply to them, only replied to them with a shipping confirmation that they were sending out a new one. So it must be a known issue at this point. Cap head screws that you're supposed to use to mount these shocks here. Now I can't remember where it is. Oh, I think on the front and back. They're not even in the kit. No cap head screws. So I used some button heads, I think the right length. At this point, I was just kind of using whatever screw was kind of closest by because it just seemed like it didn't matter what they were calling for. I was gonna to have to figure it out on my own. The problem is, is that these aren't just regular, you know, M3 screws. These are like 2.6 or whatever size that is. And I just don't have a bunch of those laying around. When I first did the unboxing video for this, I mentioned the Hobbywing motor that I got, and I believe I had some sort of comment on there that's saying like, hey, that, that motor doesn't fit. It didn't make sense that it wouldn't fit. Everything else seemed to match up. But once I started building it, or once I started to try to install it, I realized what that person really meant is that the included pinion in the kit is for the uh, smaller diameter motor shafts that exist versus the one that I had purchased was kind of a standard diameter motor shaft. So that standard motor shaft is uh, like 3.175 millimeters, something around there. The motor that came with this LC Racing one was the kind of more standardized, that 3.175 millimeter motor shaft. So just to get this thing running, I actually took the pinion out of this one originally. But those 48 pitch of the standard size motor shaft uh, are just much easier for me to come by. So th I'm a little bit thankful that I have the kind of standard size motor shaft in this car. Now here you have the completed electronics as was the case with the LC Racing and a lot of these smaller ones, very difficult to fit everything in. The thing that I would recommend, just gonna skip ahead here a little bit, is that when you do finally paint up the body, and I'll show it to you right now, get some sort of, uh, this is the this kind of flexible aluminum tape and just line a lot of the inside of it here because what that's gonna do is it's gonna protect the paint from getting chipped up from just some wires and rubbed away just from wires. Uh, as usual, I was a little impatient, decided to do it anyways, and did end up with a little bit of the paint chipping away uh, or rubbing away from the wiring underneath. Uh, as you notice, when I took this off here, I'm not using body clips, I'm actually using uh, Velcro. That's just my personal preference, kind of comes from the fact that the tent scale uh, buggies tend to have Velcro mounted bodies versus using, using body clips because it just keeps it a lot more solidly on there. Well, there are a few mistakes that I made, uh, but one of them was I installed the front turnbuckles specifically coming from the steering uh, upside down. So when I would press down on it, it would like do this crazy like toe out thing. Uh, just had to flip them around the other way. So if uh, you were not paying attention like I was while building it, you know, obviously I'm a lot distracted by all the other issues with the manual that were going on, but that's what happened with that. So now that it's completed, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning of the video, it took me a while to actually make this video because the build process was so unpleasant that I figured I would try to give this car a chance to redeem itself at the track. So I packed up my EMB, I packed up this and went to our local track here in DRC Raceway. I had heard that 
people were using just standard touring car tires for these cars, and I just have a ton of those, so that was an easy swap. I'm not gonna waste your time for the reveal. These tires for carpet racing, CRC black carpet, are terrible, and we'll get into that. I did, however, make sure that I uh, made sure that I tried these on this car, obviously, and then I also swapped them onto this to try that, and both of them uh, handled terribly. Way too much lateral grip, so you get a lot of traction rolling. Maybe if you put a little glue on the edges of the front tires, you would get less of that. However, the touring car tires just work so well that kind of no reason for it. There may be tires that work better for carpet racing for these. However, this is just what I had on hand and it was just a huge improvement over these. On top of that, they are extremely, the tires themselves are extremely bouncy. So you would get a lot of kind of it hitting and then bouncing up. Uh, even with this, which the suspension on this one is, was giving me a lot of trouble, uh, especially in the rear. It was landing and then bouncing it back up or off of a ramp or jump or the tabletop. It was kicking the back end up. Whereas uh, with touring cars, tires, it wasn't doing that. But when I put these on, it started to do that on these. Also, the 14B kept flipping over. Uh, and I know <laughs> statistically you would think it would be oh close God. to 50-50 or a little bit more oh, on one side on. than the other of which way it would land. But this Man. thing always landed upside down like some sort of suicidal turtle. I have no idea why it was doing that so regularly. This one wasn't as bad. It's still frustrating when it flips over and you have to get off the stand and go get it. But this was always landing on its back. It just becomes very tiring <laughs> when you're having to run up and down. At one point, I was just kind of standing because I was the only one at the track at this point. I was just kind of standing on the track racing it from there because I didn't want to keep running up and down the uh, driver's stand. Right, so once I determined that the touring car tires are the way to go, I made sure that I was just swapping it back and forth between um, the cars. So I was really doing everything I could to kind of make it so these were as evenly matched, at least from a setup standpoint, and electronics. As I mentioned in my unboxing video, the uh, KV of both of these motors is very similar. It has essentially the same ESC, they, they have the same servo, and uh, I'm, obviously I'm using the same radio. And by the time I was actually running them, I was using the same tires. You'll also notice that both of these have the kind of clear Lexan wings on them. These are from uh, like a 110 scale buggy, and specifically this one was straight off of my uh, associated uh, B6.4 carpet. I just think it's lighter, it provides just a little bit more stability than the kind of molded plastic ones. Since I'm not doing like crazy bashing, I'm not worried about this getting torn up just from flipping over. For whatever reason, the EMB was much louder. Uh, I'm still not 100% convinced I have this mesh set well. It's a little bit difficult to feel the mesh and you can't see the actual gear mesh in there uh, once you've installed the motor and the pinion. However, it was so much faster than this. As I mentioned earlier, I think there's still some binding going on in the drivetrain that's causing it to be a little bit slower. It was having a hard time with acceleration. It was having a hard time clearing the tabletop jump. This one did it no problem every single time. And as I mentioned, the rear of the 14B was extremely balanced. You really had to land your jumps perfectly if you didn't want that back end kicking back up. That is probably something that can be worked on with tuning, you know, whether it's uh, getting my droop set correctly, whether it's using some thicker or thinner shock oil, or maybe using softer springs. But that kind of raises another point when comparing these two kits from a purchasing standpoint. The LC Racing, this is the EMB One HK Pro kit version, and it comes with everything, right? It comes with sway bars. It actually comes with, I think, three sets of springs, both front and rear. It also comes with like the motor and the ESC and, and everything like that. But really it's the fact that it comes with basically everything that you would want at the pro level. With this, you're still having to purchase the full set of spring, uh, different spring rates. You still have to go and purchase the uh, sway bar or anti-roll bar sets separately. I think those are about 15 bucks. So it's just very different and actually this one comes with multiple rates of sway bars as well. So it's not even just one sway bar, you're getting multiple rates in the kit. There probably is some sort of perfect mix between these two because there are some issues I have with the LC Racing that I think 
this does a little bit better job at. One thing with the LC Racing is I don't really like the shock towers. Back when I first took this out, I actually took it out onto a dirt track and hit it a little bit harder and did have these aluminum shock towers bend a little bit. These shock towers are plastic and they do have their own flex. I don't know how that'll actually affect the actual drive characteristics and tuning or whatever. LC Racing does actually sell carbon fiber versions of these and I'm absolutely gonna get those because I think it's a much better way to do this. For people that are newer to the hobby, try to shy away from all the aluminum upgrades because either they bend, they don't bend back like plastic does, or they're going to transfer the energy from any type of hit to somewhere that's more expensive or more difficult to repair. Especially stay away from aluminum arms. I can't think of a lot of situations where aluminum arms are the correct answer. All the way back to the unboxing video of this. I showed that what I ended up with was about exactly the same cost for getting all the individual electronic components for this versus what came with this, but I also bought a bunch of extra parts with this at the same time. It would be difficult for me to straight up recommend the 14B, especially the kit, over the LC Racing. I think I would rather go out and buy and build the LC Racing kit again. Frankly, it had better instructions, it has better parts, and as far as parts availability goes, I don't really know what the parts availability is like for the 14B. I know there is at least one US distributor for the LC Racing parts, but of course, they're kind of available everywhere. Another thing that's kind of nice is that WL Toys, their 14 scale is a clone or maybe they're all just clones, of the LC Racing. So there's actually a lot of parts available in all sorts of different kind of levels of, uh, of quality and cost, obviously. So I think the overall recommendation is to go with the LC Racing EMB1HK Pro kit. This buggy, I think, is better uh, and better to put together than this. Now, the one caveat is maybe after a lot of tuning, this will be better, but I still think out of the box, this was a better purchase. So that's all I have for you today. Thank you. Please like and subscribe. The Quiet RC decals are still available. A link to the store is below. Uh, it's all I have for sale in the store right now, but it really helps support the channel. I really appreciate it if you grab one. Also, please remember to like and subscribe. Thank you, and we'll talk RC again later.